Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this um, uh, short, snappy lunchtime ses session uh, sponsored um, by Vivashore Medical uh, entitled Finishing Strong. Uh, my name is Darren Milet. Uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist from Galway. Uh, and I'm in, uh, joined by panelists from around the world, from Canada, the US, Netherlands, and Denmark, two Belgians in the middle, but they're in different countries at the moment. Um, and what we hope to do over the next 45 minutes is, is to review best practices in terms of vascular access and closure, um, to give you some information on, uh, on the Vivashore um, uh, patch closure system, um, uh, to offer a couple of interesting cases from, from Robert and, and, and Vijay, um, and if we can do all of that with a little bit of interaction and get, and get, some, uh, uh, get some comments from you guys, that would be, that would be great. Um, so, first thing I, I think that we, need to, uh, that we need to discuss is that vascular access issues remain common. Despite the fact that we've reduced pacemakers, we've reduced power valvular leak and so on and so forth, vascular access complications are still occurring in you know, almost uh, one, in, what, 1 in 10, 1 in 20 patients. Um, and it's now the most, common, um, uh, the most common issue that we have, the most common complication outside of conduction disturbance. Um, this is the case that I did recently, um, a patient who had prior EVAR, um, it's a little bit hard, that blush is hard to see, um, but this patient was bleeding profusely at the end of the procedure, and despite best practices, we ended up having to put a covered stent in to, to, uh, to close this patient's anatomy. Um, so what I wanted to first get from you guys was um, a, an understanding of what you're doing at the moment. Um, Ole, you showed us a case a few minutes ago that was a single proglide, probably with an added angio seal at the end of the case. Um, but most people, I think, are still using two plug-based or, or suture-based closures. Is that right? Can I see a show of that? Who's using two, two proglides to close most of their cases? Okay. Who's using a single proglide? Okay. And who's using a single proglide with the plan to put an extra angio seal in there? Yeah. Okay, so I think that's a strategy that's really been developed over, over the last number of years and, and I think bails us out of a lot of oozing in the groin. Of course, we do have dedicated devices and these devices are in development. We've seen first and second generation iterations of them. They're not perfect. Um, they, they have got a little bit of distance to travel in terms of, uh, in terms of being as, as safe and efficacious as, 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 we, as we would like. But it seems like the, 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 our community remains ready for the second generation of these devices because, as I just showed you, we're still having significant vascular complications. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Ole. And Ole is going to take us through his best practices for vascular access and vascular closure independent of any devices. Um, so Ole, give us some tips and tricks, please. Yeah. Well, this is more just to, not specific tips and tricks, but it's more to set the stage a little bit on what is important um, for, from access to closure, if you talk about TAVI related uh, access and closure. So I think, I think about these six topics. Um, first of all, and I will go maybe, uh, I will quickly name them and then I have one slide per topic. So pre-procedural CT analysis, I think you have that data available, so why not use it? I see so many operators not using it. Secondly, echo guided vascular puncture. I think we're we are over the last couple of years, most of the people agree that echo guided puncture has a lot of benefits as compared to blind or fluoroscopy based. Then another thing is patient tailor approach. That's a little bit what I always uh, mention is that I don't like operators who say, I always do only this and I never do this, 100%. No, I, I look to the complexity of the case I'm involved in. I mean, most of the time I don't use a safety wire, but if I do a very complex transfemoral where I push with shockwave or with atherectomy or something, I would be stupid not to use a, a safety wire. Yeah? So I taper to the needs and the complexity of the case. Then your choice of vascular de closure device. As Darren already mentioned, different devices that are possible. We're going to talk about that more in detail in this session. Control of vascular access, that's another uh, interesting point. So many ways um, of controlling your closure. There are some colleagues that do it from the radial approach and they spend sometimes a couple of minutes of radiation to get a pigtail down there and, or another catheter and control it. And what then if you can't? Or contralateral uh, control or maybe through the arteriotomy of the TAVI as we do or maybe echo guided control. Some people don't do an angiographic control, do only the echo control. So there's many ways of doing it. I don't say one is better than the other. And then the finally th final thing is percutaneous bailout. I think in my whole career doing 
so many Tavis. I never, ever, I hope I, I have to knock wood, but I zero times in my whole life I had to call a vascular surgeon. I think you have to have the skill set to fix it yourself. Yes, to, you have to have the necessary material in the lab, balloons, stents, and I all did, that. I did. So, finishing strong, I think first pre-procedural CT, uh, I think that's what I want to show here. You have that CT available, so really look at that CT. I spend a couple of minutes on the access. It's just almost the same as I studied the valve. Uh, I see sometimes people going into a case, they just look to that dimension report from the company where they see just these vessels like this. I like to go to, to scroll through the CT, look at the iliacs, look all the way to the femoral puncture site. And sometimes you, define, you, you detect that there's maybe, as you see in this particular case, it looks a great vessel, but then rather close one centimeter above the puncture site, there's kind of a circumferential calcification on the right hand side. So if you find that out, then it's maybe better to go to the left side or look, have a look, memorize where the bifurcation of the femoral is. So if you have, stand there in a, in a situation where you have to st stand or bail out, I write down the size of the R3. I know exactly where the bifurcation is. And I take that information in the lab just in case that we have to bail out. So that's <coughs> the point I want to make with that. Very short also on echo guided puncture, different schools there. Some people like to use just only the short axis view as you see on the top view. Um, other people, they go, they do a combine, combination as I do. I do short axis longitudinal view, but some people only do the longitudinal view and that's also fair enough. The benefit of doing a longitudinal view is that you can avoid puncturing in the part where the artery starts to dive down. You see that every common femoral artery has a part just above the femur head where it starts to go pretty steep down. You can make a puncture there, but if you make a puncture there, your vascular closure device failure rate goes exponentially up. So it's better not to puncture in that diving, in that diving part of the common femoral artery. Um, yeah, that's just a little, I can skip over this, but this is also, it's important where, to see the art, this is the bifurcation, as you see, superficial profunda, we go up a little bit again, then we see the common femoral artery. This is a very skinny patient. It's also uh, important to look not only where the artery is here, it's centralized, and then you see the, uh, the, the bouncing, the tenting on the artery, we're in, and then the wire goes in. It's also important to look on where the depth of that artery is, regarding to where you puncture the skin. If your artery is, let's say, at five centimeters of depth on your echo, you also have to make the skin puncture at a little bit of distance, four or five centimeters, compared to your echo. Because if you just puncture right, just next to your echo probe, and your artery is at five centimeters, you will never see the tip of the needle bouncing on the artery. So that's a common mistake that fellows make. Then. Here, that's a patient tailor approach. As I said, if, if I have a little bit more complex setup, I do like to have some built-in, some safety net or two nets. Um, this I won't tackle, but that's the suture-based, patch-based, collagen-based. And sometimes these, these, these technologies, are you can use them together. Or I use one as a bailout. Or you, it's not because you choose one closure device technique that you have to stick with that. You can combine a couple of these. Uh, I've, I've done that a couple of times. Then the uh, control, either that's the angio control as we do nowadays in Copenhagen. So after the re retracting the large introducer sheet, we pull on our ProGlide. Most of the time, again, there again, it's not 100%. It's 85% of cases where we go for single ProGlide. In some more challenging cases, we still add the second as a pre-closure. But then we, we pull on these ProGlides, we tighten them already, and we go in with a six or an eight French sheet. We make a small control angio. And if we see this, then we know it's probably good, or we're gonna add an ang angio seal. Typically, we add an angio seal if it's a single proglide. On the right-hand side, that's just an echo control. You see very nice if the flow is fine, and if you take the color away, then also you can very often uh, see actually very nice, uh, the, if you use an angio seal, sometimes you see the foot plate of, the, of that, so, uh, and that there's, you can exclude that there's a uh, pseudo aneurysm, for example. And then finally, um, as I said, I think you have to be able to bail out your own problems. So, for example, there we had a failure of the closure, and then we had clearly there we went for an ipsilateral lower puncture, and then we fixed uh, the issue. So, I think these six parts or aspects are key for me from to go for a good access to a good closure of your cases. And in contemporary practice, I think you should really aim in your practice that you have less than 1% major vascular complications if you do TAVI. And I think you can obtain that if you integrate these aspects in a correct way. Yes.
Ola, you've never, you've never called a vascular surgeon? It's no. impressive. I have really? lots Honestly, of times. Zero. My yeah. vascular surgeon is not a very nice guy. The guy who works on Wednesday is not a very nice guy. Um, questions for Ole from you guys in relation to how he does his closure or, or, or things that you do differently? Anyone want to give us any tips or tricks of what you do in your own practice? No? I've been quiet this afternoon. You catch? <coughs> Whoa. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right. What makes you decide that it's going to be one proglide or two proglides? Uh, I... Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. good question. Uh, I have done it uh, usually when I see that uh, the first proglide is causing a lot of problem with calcium. I leave it at one and then try to do something after that because the more you go in and out, mm -hmm. it looks like the hematoma gets bigger and uh, this tend to fail. But I just wanted to know from the panel. Thank you. What oh. Typically, it's one, yes. Uh, it depends. I mean, very often I don't deploy these proglides myself. It's a fellow who does it. If I have doubt that he did it correct on the first one, or maybe he pushed the needle already out while there was maybe still some bleed back, or I'm not sure the bleed the, the bleed back was stopped, or if I have doubts about the first one, um, um, my threshold to use the second one is, is low. But standards-wise, I would say we keep it with one. Um, but okay, I mean, I don't say you have to do that. I mean, everybody has to do what they feel most comfortable with, I think, you know. It took me also a couple of months to get to that comfort zone, and now I feel good with it, and I sometimes have the impression that sometimes using two, these two proglides sometimes interact with each other. They do more bad than good. So if I do, if I have a very clean puncture, if I have a very clean pull back on my, and, and good feel with my one single proglide, and I deploy it at 12 o'clock, I feel nowadays so confident with it that it goes well that I do it, but I, look, I mean, again, I'm not the guy who says you have to do 100% of times this or that, or I think everybody should adapt to his own, uh, what he feels most comfortable with. I think you sh medicine should be like that. Yeah. I, I think there are also, it, it's also a case by case discussion. Um, yeah. For instance, exactly. if you have the scenario that there is only one uh, femoral artery accessible and your left side is not accessible and you, you would, for whatever reason, require re-access in the following weeks, mm. then you preferably don't want to have an angio seal there in, and that would be, um, for me at least, um, an argument in favor of two proglides mm. to start. Yeah. And, and help me understand, so in, but in principle you use two devices, right? You always use one Most proglide and then, yeah. well, but, but, but if you have a six or eight French sheet, what if you take that out, you do manual compression? No, no, then we, most of the time, well, if it's a very small artery and, um, and it looks already a bit tapered, and we use, for example, two prolets, then we're gonna just, uh, then it typically, we tighten just the knots and that's enough. But, but I mean, so you always will, and typically you use two devices, and yeah. it's yeah, most typically of yeah, yeah. one yeah, proglide. Yeah, it's very rare that and, I use uh, one. Yeah. And the angio seal, is it a six French or an eight French angio seal? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, actually, it's always nowadays, it's an eight. We thought in the baby that we would taper it, but actually what the company tells me is that the, the foot plate in the vessel is exactly the same size. It's just the collagen, yeah, on, collagen the, on the, on the yeah, top, bigger. that which is yeah. bigger or not. So now I could just go for eight. Yep. And I must say, Ole, I, I recently visited Ole in Copenhagen and it's a very smooth, very, uh, we were one of those who so our secondary access is radial and we would spend 20 minutes coming down from the radial, getting that extra long multi-purpose down into the leg, taking all those extra x-rays and I really like you pull one per close, you put a six or an eight French sheet in and you do the angio um, uh, retrograde. If you've got a problem, you see it and then you can react. And if you don't have a problem, you take out your six French or your eight French and you replace it with an angio seal. So it's, it's a very efficient system. Uh, other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Do you sometimes use a SFA? Um, yeah. If it's a good caliber and less calcifications yeah. and common? Yeah, I've done that or, definitely. For, uh, SFA as a, as a safety at a bailout or SFA as a no, primary time, access? Primary, Primary access. access. Yeah, yeah, sure, I've done this. I mean, especially sometimes you're forced to do it in extremely obese patients, you know? We have, unfortunately, <clears throat> these patients with BMI 45, 50, even 55. I mean, then you, yeah, you go in the SFA. I've done that. Then I maybe, in most of the cases, I still maybe try to, because SFA fails a little bit more for your closure then, then I maybe sometimes, if I can, I would build in some, uh, if you can come, then it's only contralateral because you already puncture low then. Then you can go for a contralateral maybe safety uh, 
wire if you want. Yeah. And, and there is a the higher you can get it though, right? If you can get it, some, sometimes yeah, yeah. the bifurcation is is so low that the SFA actually is is down here in the middle of the leg with nothing well, to press. And that on is it. the that is the word. If of you can get it higher to press on it, it's good. Yeah. But you have to be careful with SFA. Yeah? Sometimes you have uh, anterior calcification, the common artery, and it's uh, a little bit hostile. Mm. What's, well, what's, have you tried it? What's your experience with it? Yes, I have uh, not a lot, but maybe <laughs> 10 times. Okay, that's, that's, look, maybe, I mean, that's a good experience. Few. And, and so far, so good? No pseudoaneurysms, no bleeding that you were unable to control? So far, so good, but with a great caliber. Okay, mm. okay so big vessel, no calcium, it's okay. Uh, and better than common artery. Perfect. But what you could do, I mean, this is controversial and, and the companies will not like me to say this, but for example, if you have a very calcified puncture site on both sides, let's say it's horribly calcified, that you know suture base is not going to work there at all. What my approach is, then I still, and I think all the rest of the vessels are fine, I will still do that case probably transfemorally. What I will do is I do a puncture. Um, then I do for sure a safety wire. I anticipate either that I maybe have to stand already, but what worked well in my experience is then use in these cases, for example, a Manta, or you could go, maybe I don't have experience yet, but with a patch-based closure device. And then if you deploy that, uh, then it's of course in the customer, then you have a balloon ready there from the contralateral, the inflate, you optimize that uh, foot plate, that anchor, and I have excellent outcomes with that, you know, so where you don't need a covered stand. So, so you see, you can be creative in these things. Of course, it's out of eye view. I want to say that. It's not according to what the company says, but these things are, are doable. Yeah. Okay, other questions about access for Ole? Yeah. I'll come a little bit closer. <laughs> It was more like a comment. Uh, I must admit, I've never feared the superficial. I don't know how many cases I've done. I've done many, mm. and I've, I haven't felt it as a problem. I think we, we can use it without any hesitation. You can. Uh, uh, the other thing is just, uh, I've never done it, but uh, I just uh, heard a guy from USA who actually, when you have these severely calcified arteries with no access, He'd, he'd put in a shockwave the other way around, and apparently that softens the, the calcium so you can use your progress anyway. You can get dissection, though, when you do that, obviously, yeah. and, and, and it, can, it can make it a little more challenging. But, yeah, sometimes you've, you've got to try and, and, as you said, Ole, be a little bit creative. Well, okay. sometimes an alternative access is a good strategy. Uh, absolutely. Yeah? So absolutely. these days you can do a yeah, completely percutaneous transaxillary mm -hmm. procedure under local anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So the, the impact of a transaxillary approach is also getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, there's a limit how far you can push things. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Nico, you're going to take us through um, patch-based closure. Um, yeah. Let's, uh, let's get your slides up. And, yeah, uh, so while we're waiting for the slides, I think so we have a couple of reasons to visit Copenhagen now. Eh? This, it's a beautiful city and you can also find a unicorn in the cat lab. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's good. So I must, I must confess, I, uh, from I think once or twice a year, a vascular surgeon visits me in the cat lab. It's not really because I want it, but because I have to. Um, so it is, uh, it is always good to have a good relationship with your uh, surgeon. Okay, here's the clicker. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about patch-based closure. And uh, most of you will be familiar with sutures and with plug-based closure, with angio seals or with manta for large bore accesses. And these are my conflicts. I think in the space, we have now two randomized controlled trials. And uh, this is important because randomized controlled trials will give us um, information that we will not gather from retrospective or even prospective registries. And uh, this is an interesting one, uh, this particular situation. So we have a publication in Jack, uh, Cardiovascular Interventions, and one in Circulation, where two proglides was compared to one Manta. Both trials had their limitations. Uh, but both trials had a clear trend towards more complications with, um, with the plug-based closure. And if you then combine the trials um, and you do a meta-analysis, then the results basically are totally opposite of, the re of what you would see if you do a retrospective comparison of suture-based versus plug-based closure. So from the retrospective analyses, it, uh, it seemed to be that... Um, the, uh, let me see, does this work? No. Okay, but you see on the right-hand side, you see that Manta seems to be better than Proglide. But once you enter the randomized controlled studies, the reality was reversed. If you keep your finger on that, there you oh. go. Oh, 
Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. It's so, a patch. So for who did not see it, <laughs> here you go. Yeah. So here you see from the registries that Manta seems to be the safer option. But then when you uh, look into the randomized control studies, the reality seem to be opposite. And there are reasons to help explain why this is. I think both uh, randomized controlled trials had their intrinsic limitations in terms of how to get access. For instance, in the German study, there was no ultrasound guided access. In the Rotterdam Toulouse study, there was no systematic use of protamine. So there were lessons learned from both randomized controlled trials. But, I get, but again, I think this is going to be very important when we want to implement future technologies in in this uh, important space. Now, let me tell you something about patch-based closure. This is the Percuseal, and um, Percuseal is a different concept. It will remind you of um, maybe a Manta or um, uh, Angel Seal, but it's totally different. It consists of an internal patch and an external fixation mechanism. It's Simple to use, intuitive, uh, there are two sizes, and basically um, you can treat vessels with a vessel diameter between 14 and 24 French um, on the arterial side. And now with this Percuseal Elite, which is the latest generation of this technology, there is also uh, an opportunity to close large bore venous access up to 30 French. And this becomes very important because if we look at the TMVR and TTVR space, the devices are becoming 30 French and smaller in terms of profile. The this patch behaves differently from the other technologies around. What the patch does is also it traps platelets. And these platelets get activated by the collagen in the in the but by the collagen fibers, and then you create a physical bond between the patch and the arteriotomy side, and by doing so, you close the arteriotomy. It's a very effective way of closure. It has been studied in multiple uh, prospective registries, the frontier family of registries, um, uh, and uh, it showed Definitely safety. I think the, the number of vascular complications over five prospective registries were in the, you can count them on, on the fingers of one hand. Uh, and this is a, an example of a venous closure in a pig model that, that we did a couple of months ago in um, Rotterdam. So this is the inferior cable vein that has been accessed with um, a 20 French system. And here we have exchange for the Percuseal sheath, you deploy the, the patch on the inside, you pull the patch towards the venotomy, and then you um, deploy the fixation mechanism. And you see there is uh, immediate hemostasis in this pig model that was, by the way, also anticoagulated with uh, heparin. So this looks very promising, uh, not only in the arterial space, but also in the venous space as a closure device. To conclude, um, uh, I demonstrated patch-based closure. There are two large or larger prospective studies uh, ongoing, one in the United States that is led by Dr. Ayer, and one in uh, Europe that uh, uh, recently uh, enrolled the first patient. Uh, in the European trial, there is, there is going to be an arterial uh, leg and there is going to be a venous uh, cohort where we uh, will treat um, over 200 patients in total. Any questions on the patches? So, Nico, thanks for that. Um, one question, I suppose, relates to, to I mean, that's, this is the first patch for, for a venotomy site. Yeah. I mean, most of us would say, well, venous closure, put a perclose in, press on it, do a figure of eight. But equally, if we look at the data, eight, ten percent major or life-threatening vascular complications in triluminate. Um, is, this a, is this a major problem that this could solve? Well, there's definitely a problem with large bore venous access, and we also know it from the uh, from the intrepid trials uh, in the United States. There was also a bleeding signal. Um, whether um, we solve it with a, a new kind of uh, closure device, or whether we solve it with smaller profile uh, delivery catheters, okay, I think we will need both. But I do see um, an indication for more reliable closure mechanisms. That said, I think with our tier experience of, uh, that is growing uh, globally, uh, we typically use two proglides in, uh, for 
24 French systems yeah. and it works very well as well. Yeah, equally I would say that my last visit with my vascular surgeon, Ole, you haven't had this experience, was a venous, was a venous stick and apparently I stuck right at, at the bifurcation of, uh, uh, of, the, of the femoral vein. Um, and the patient went to theater for an exploration and, yeah. a, and, a, and a patch closure because it was it, it just it just wouldn't stop bleeding. So yeah, but that, that and that's the problem, right? Punctures um, at the bifurcation of arteries or veins that is something that you need to avoid at I all times. I know that now. Thank you. <laughs> and also a, a patch closure will not help you there. By okay. The way. Yeah, just okay. a question on that patch itself. How does it feel? How flexible or stiff is that? Or it's how very it, it's it's relatively flexible. flexible. So you can really compress it. Yeah. between your fingers okay. and it's um, you know the, one of the advantages is that and you what, also what, need what's to the you size don't, you what's the size of it like the um, what the, what's the size I know I don't know the correct if I would say it out of my hand is it 12 or 15 Andy, millimeters you want to you want to tell us the patch is uh, 20 by 15 millimeters and it's uh, 200 microns thick and, and very flexible on the inside, yeah. but actually the, the fixation mechanism is, is quite stiff. But you the, don't need to measure any venotomy depths or arteriotomy depths. So what you need to do with a manta, for instance, that's not required with you this. You don't have to do anything pre... No preparations up yeah. front. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think that's, that's important here, and you mentioned reaccess a few minutes ago, is that this whole system is completely absorbable, right? Yeah. This thing goes away. Um, and as far as I understand, within three months, the patch is completely reabsorbed, so you can reaccess if 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 needed be. Not just the actual patch on the internal, but the actual fixation mechanism yeah. on the outside. VJ, do you have That's a comment? That's correct. Uh, yeah. So the patch does. Before you put it in, you do need to wet the patch in uh, non-heparinized saline to put it in, just to activate it. But it does give you a little bit of a tactile feel as you're deploying it, and that does allow you to deploy the device. But uh, you're right, you can barely, you cannot see it, and the only disadvantage, you really can't see any of the system in the flora. So once you deploy it, it's deployed. But you can see it with the ultrasound. Yeah. Uh, we have not reaccessed through it yet, but certainly theoretically you can reaccess it after, after that period when it's sort of completely. We've done uh, uh, ultrasounds on these patients at 30 days, and you can barely see anything left behind. So Vijay, you're going to share a case with us in just a moment. <coughs> Anybody have any questions for, for <coughs> Vijay, for, um, for Nicholas, on the, on the concept of using patches or plugs? Yeah. Were there any thrombotic complications since um, you said that uh, it attracts thrombocytes? Yeah, so collagen is, is the most um, dramatic platelet activator. Um, have you seen thromboses early or late uh, in, the, in the studies with this? So, no. So there are no, th this is one of the interesting features and findings from the Frontier uh, registry, uh, Registries, a family of studies. Uh, no late complications, zero. And no thrombosis. So we know, for instance, with Manta closure, we do see uh, thrombosis, but those are often almost always acute uh, occlusions and thrombosis. Yeah. Do you always do an angiogram after the patch? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I think um, um, some kind of confirmation of patent hemostasis for large bore closure is uh, fundamental. So we do that, yes. I don't know what, uh, what your practice or what your practice is, but I, for the arteries, I will do it all the time. Yeah, so we, we actually went away from doing a final angiogram because it was too much of a pain to come down from the leg. Then I've started to visit Ole in Copenhagen, and now I, I do that retrograde injection. But definitely in patients who have, who have you know, poor renal function, um, we'll just take the ultrasound probe. Um, if you've got a, of course, if you've got a complication higher up, you're not going to see that with an ultrasound probe, but you know you've had some difficulty at that point of the procedure. But very often you see very nicely with an ultrasound yeah, whether you've got an issue. But and you can see the patch very easily, VJ, on ultrasound, right? Yes, you certainly can. I, I, to that point about completion angios, I think we've done completion angios in pretty much every large bore arterial device that we do. Even after two per closes, if you want to do a completion angiogram, you can take your micropuncture sheet through your wire and do the angio through it and then just pull and tighten your per close. So that's another way that you can actually confirm it and you can use two cc's of dye to get the picture done. So, several um, ways, several ways. Uh, so, yeah. so Vijay, why don't we get on, you show us a case, and then we can, we can maybe Robert, you, Robert's got another interesting case. Why don't we put those two cases together, 
and then we can have a conversation around what it looks like, what it feels like, and so forth afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to talk about a transcatheter article placement that we close with the brachial. I don't have any conflicts. Uh, this is a 79-year-old gentleman with a uh, couple of the typical sort of comorbidities. On the uh, CT, we had an annulus of 565. Our plan was to do a 29 millimeter S3 ultra zilia valve um, with the right transfemoral procedure. And this was patient was uh, enrolled in the patch trial approved by the trial committee. This is a typical CT. You can see large vessels, no calcification uh, above or below the arteriotomy, which is an important criteria for the trial. Uh, no anterior or posterior calcification. You can see vessels are really. I mean, you could do, you could make an argument this is probably good for any closure device at this point. Uh, this is the actual device at the end of the closure. Uh, so we basically replace the Edwards sheath for the Manta, uh, for the Vivasur per uh, Percusil sheath over the O3-5 wire. Once the, uh, you, got, you get it to the point where you start to see the blood come back and from there advance it four markers on the sheet. Typically, if you've done ultrasound-based access, you know what that depth is going to be. At this point, where you've gone four deep, you take the wire and the dilator out. The O3-5 wire then gets replaced with an O1-4 wire, which for me is a BMW wire, but it could be any wire of your choice. And the current generation of the patch device actually goes over or gets delivered over the O1-4 wire. And there's a couple of locking mechanisms. If you have a moment, you can stop by the booth to get a clearer understanding of it. Uh, there's a very uh, uh, labeled sequence of steps that you go through. Uh, you basically turn your knob to expose the patch, bring it back to the arteriotomy, and you essentially deliver the patch and you pull back till you feel tension. And this part is extremely important. Do not pull too hard, but you want to feel the tension. And most importantly, at this point, you maintain that tension for a full four minutes. Now, four minutes in the life of an interventional cardiologist is a long time, and even longer when you're waiting uh, with the time turned on. So it's four minutes, and you watch. At the time that you are comfortable, that you like, you obviously pull the wire off before you start. You fire the sort of the locator mechanism there, which keeps it in place. Now I'm holding tension and making sure that I have not changed the angle at which my device is, and I'm trying to not change the tension because the patch has to be against the anterior wall of the arteriotomy to get complete closure, and now we're just holding. At the point, we've gone through four minutes, and sometimes it's a little bit longer just to be safe. Um, you essentially relax your tension and make sure that you don't have a lot of bleeding around there. If you see a little bit of a ooze, you may choose to hold a little bit longer. And at the end of it, you fire your release mechanism, take the device out. And this is sort of me holding very gentle tension, making sure we're doing OK. Uh, and if we're happy, we take our completion angiogram and we move on. Uh, there's a couple of steps here where you really, uh, and this took us a, a, a couple of devices to get the feel for the, how much tension to hold, how much is too much, and how much is too little. It does have a slightly different feel compared to your existing device. Like the Manta and the Angioseal, you tend to pull a little bit harder uh, to make, make sure that your collagen plug is completely against the wall. Here, you're pulling the patch against the anterior wall, so the tension is a little bit softer, but you still want to feel, you have that tactile feel pretty well. So, um, and this is it. I think we have a completion angio after this. I always take a lot of these completion angios with DSA, and you can see, we have virtually, uh, there's nothing that you can see. You can see a little bit of the patch there, if you look very carefully. Uh, and this is with the uh, ultrasound performed next day, looking for the patch, and you can see good flow. Um, I don't know that you can very clearly see the patch here, but many times you can see an extra layer of echo density that tells you where the patch is. Uh, and that was the case. If you have any questions, be happy to take them. Mm -hmm. so So Robert, why don't we move on to your case and you show us your case of a delayed closure um, and then we'll get you guys together to take some questions maybe at, at the end of that if, that, if that works okay. All right, so 
uh, I'm going to present a case. It's not a tabric case. It's a, a patient who was a little unstable, required a large bore access for effective therapy, and ultimately underwent a uh, vivisher uh, percussial closure of the large bore access uh, with good outcome. Uh, did well clinically. So uh, my case is a 74-year-old man with a medical history of coronary artery disease. He has known multivessel coronary artery disease, declined uh, revascularization in the past, and he presented with uh, acute onset of uh, dyspnea on exertion, severely limited to less than one block. Uh, his uh, admission laboratories were unremarkable, had a uh, normal hemoglobin, normal platelets, which is important because, I mean, that's required for use of the Percuseal. Transthoracic echo, he had uh, findings that were consistent with moderate to severe aortic stenosis, and you can see on the angiogram here that he had just horrendous disease here, evidence of a left main um, involvement. Um, it was a left dominant system. The cardiothoracic surgery was consulted. He was turned down for surgery uh, because of significant kyphosis and the implications for post-operative uh, rehabilitation was bad. So the alternative plan was a PAV uh, using Pella support and with Pella support, rolled out the left main and the LAD uh, uh, in treatment with the stent. So uh, as we uh, embarked on this case, he was slightly um, unstable. He had a cardiac index of about 1.6. He was on a little bit of pressors. So in a patient like this where you're sort of anticipating a protracted use of an impeller device, I mean, what do you do? Do you pre-close? Maybe we can talk about these uh, questions, you know, uh, during a questions, uh, question and answer. Do you remove the peel-away sheath? When? Why? Um, anatomical considerations for the Percuseal. And I think we have to follow basic principles that, you know, Ole just presented. So here, what, here you can see that uh, it, you know, we have a puncture in the mid-femoral head. Um, because the Percuseal is about two centimeters long and 1.5 centimeters wide, you have to make sure that you're about two, at least two centimeters um, uh, up from the bifurcation. Uh, the angle of the patch, as it connects with the shaft of the delivery device, is about 20 degrees. So you want to make sure that your angle of entry into the vessel is about 20 degrees. And as Ole said, however, if you're up here, right, where the femoral artery, the external iliac sort of dives down, you know, that angle can be a little bit challenging, so you may have problems with the, with, with the patch adhering to the anterior surface of your vessel. So we did a BAV. Uh, we used about a 22-millimeter 20, uh, balloon, and you can see that the patient's head is in the field because he could not lay down flat. So we had to, he, I mean, he was in uh, pulmonary edema here. <clears throat> so we had a, uh, you know, a pretty good um, outcome here with the left main standing, extending into the LAD. And um, this is the, in this particular case, you know, this is the post uh, deployment of the Percuseal. And you can see that there's a very good hemostasis. What if you have bleeding after the Percuseal, though? And this is something that I had to discuss with my staff at my institution because this is a kind of a different concept, right? Because most, most closure devices, you know, the plug-based, you know, they're on the surface of the vessel. This is on the inside of the vessel. So the immediate reaction when there's any, any bit of bleeding, what do you do? You compress, right? Right on top of the arteriotomy, which is exactly what you don't want to do with a Percuseal. Mm -hmm. So again, manual compression, what you want to do is you want to compress, you know, a bit proximally, in fact, four centimeters above uh, the perc site. You don't want to compress too much. And I think the mechanism of the bleeding is not because there's catastrophic failure. I mean, if you have a 16 French hole and there's catastrophic failure, you're going to know. If you have a little bit of a pulsatile bleed, and I think what happens, and you know, we could ask the physician or colleagues, you know, what their thoughts on this is. And I think there's a little bit of a blood that goes underneath the patch. And what you're doing is when you're holding uh, compression, somewhat proximal, you're decreasing uh, the velocity of the flow around the patch, and you're allowing the patch to sort of adhere. I think that's what you're doing. Um, 
if you have bleeding, and I think there was only one case where we had to do this, you can go up and over from the contralateral side. And if you think about the mechanism of how this closes, makes sense, right? You have a patch that's on the inside of the vest. So if you blow up a balloon, it's going to make the patch adhere a little bit more, right? So the balloon sizing, um, it has to be at least one to one, obviously. And what we do is we just uh, inflate the uh, balloon up to uh, uh, profile to make sure that it adheres to the patch. I mean, you don't need to go crazy with uh, uh, inflation pressures. And uh, well, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, so we've seen a couple of cases, um, uh, an acute closure, an elective case, and Robert, yours was a little bit more of an unstable patient who came, had, had a procedure done and then had to come back and take the impella out. So certainly a nice, a nice solution for delayed closure cases rather than, for example, pre-closing and leaving per closes hanging out and they can get infected. Um, questions about these cases for, for Robert or, or for Vijay? Um, one of the questions I have is in terms, VJ, in terms of reversing the heparin, is this something you do routinely with this device? Um, sure. what, what if a patient is on duodenal platelet therapy because they've had a PCI a couple of months before? If this is a, a collagen-mediated platelet activation plug, does that impact? So for all of our closures, we've been doing uh, what we call the sort of the 3M protocol for Vancouver, which is one-third reversal. So we don't do full reversal, but one-third reversal. We like that ACT to drop you know, below 180 if possible to make sure that we can get uh, good closure. That's for okay. every case, even the patch cases. Okay. And Robert, in your experience, how, how many of these cases are you putting the patch in and then you're having to do something else? You're having to balloon or you're having to press for a considerable amount of time because very often it's a convenience to have, a, to have this vessel closed immediately. What proportion of cases are you having to do something else? It's very rare that we have to go up and over, and I think there was just only one case that where we had to do that. Um, I think in the majority of cases, it's a very, very fast closure, and especially in cases where you've left a sheath in for some period of time, and then you apply this patch. And I think the theory is that you know, with the with the sheath there, it probably promotes some platelet adhesion around the arterios arteriotomy side. So then. In that condition, when you apply the sheath, it's almost instantaneous closure. Okay. BJ, maybe one final question for you. Um, um, in, in relation to the type of patients that can have this treatment, we, your case was just beautiful. I, I don't get patients like that very often. What if the patient's got some calcium? What vessel size is okay or not okay? And I, and I know that these things evolve as we get more experience, but what, what's your... So in the trial, uh, we have really avoided any degree of calcification at the arteriotomy site. Preferably no calcium two, two centimeters above and below the arteriotomy. Um, avoided morbidly obese patients. Though the last two patients that I did, both were, you know, what I call buffalo mediums. So sort of weights of like 95 to 100 kilograms. Mm -hmm. uh, so the arteriotomy sticks are about five when the arteriotomy is deeper than eight, I tend to worry about the device simply because I just don't have enough experience to say that it's going to work well. We tend to avoid those patients. Okay, so emerging experience. <laughs> okay, so look, um, uh, I think we, we've heard from Ole. Um, interesting techniques. Use the CT, ultrasound guided puncture, patient tailored approach, have a bailout plan. Um, and, 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 and if you do that, your risk of vascular complications in Copenhagen is zero. Nico, unfortunately, and I have a few more we of those vascular, vascular complications. We have vascular complications, <laughs> but we bail them out. You deal with them. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Nico and I have good relationships with our vascular surgeons, or maybe bad in my, in my sense, but we heard from Nico um, about patch-based closure, that, that, this, um, that these devices do offer a, a potential solution for routine patients, but also delayed closure patients like Robert's case or indeed potentially for bailout cases uh, in, in which we fail to close with more traditional methods. Um, we saw a great case from VJ in terms of a, a standard transfemoral TAVI with a perfect closure, and Robert showed us the delayed closure. So with that, I want to thank you guys for coming. I want to thank Vivashore Medi Me Medical for, uh, for supporting um, this session, uh, and I wish you a good meeting and safe home later on this afternoon.